Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. A movie titled after my favorite treat was a must-see for me. Of course, a chance to see Johnny Depp on the big screen didn't hurt either. So I went to see Chocolat last year in Winnipeg, mostly for the sheer pleasure. I was pleasantly surprised to find the movie had substance as well as sensuality. I heard she was some kind of radical. I heard she's an atheist. What's that? I don't know. The Inn and her daughter Anouk are travelers, descendants of Mayan women who are destined to follow the north wind from place to place, never settling down. Vien's father married such a woman when he was in Mexico, and against all advice brought her back to France. After Vien was born, her mother felt the north wind and left her husband taking Vien with her. Vien carried on the tradition taking a nook from town to town, opening a chocolaterie in each town, using ancient Mayan ingredients that not only satisfied the sweet tooth, but also cured the body and soul. But invariably Vien felt the north wind again, and packed up and left, taking a nook with her. Rue is also a traveler, a river rat, who lives with a community of boat people who drift from town to town, selling what they can to stay alive. I should probably warn you, you make friends with us, you make enemies of others. Better promise? Like Vienne, Rue finds it difficult to stay in one place. And like Vienne, Rue enjoys a life filled with sensual pleasures. The river rats are gypsy-like in their expressions of freedom and mobility, and their love of music and dance. The town where Vienne and Rue meet is a small Catholic town, under the watchful, controlling eye of Comte Reynaud. The presence of strangers, especially non-Catholic strangers during Lent, is disturbing to the Comte, and what disturbs the Comte disturbs the town. Opening a chocolaterie just in time for Lent. Oh, yes, it does seem inappropriate. The stage is set in this mix for everyone to learn a life lesson, and the comedic love story is quite predictable, but enjoyable and beautiful to watch nonetheless. There are several other plots entwined with the love story of Vienne and Rue, and their problems with the Comte, but the interactions of these strangers with the town piqued my sociological imagination the most. The advertisements for the movie declare it a comedic fable, set in an old-fashioned buttoned-up community in France in 1859. The ads go on to say it might as well be 1859 because of the backward ways in which the town views those different from them. After watching the European elections this spring, I thought the fable could be set in 2002. Fear of strangers is back in vogue, and the implications of this fear are staggering and tragic. Jorg Hader of Austria, Flemish Block of Belgium, Pia Jarsgaard of Denmark, Jean-Marie Le Pen of France, Makus Voridis of Greece, Umberto Bassi and Gianfranco Finney of Italy, Carl Hagen of Norway, Paul Portis of Portugal, Christoph Blocker of Switzerland, Nick Griffin of the United Kingdom, and three key right-wing parties in Germany, have made varying but significant gains in the governments of their respective countries over the past few years, and their popularity seems to be growing. One of the reasons for the growth in popularity of these extremists is that more Europeans are expressing fear of immigrants in general, and Muslims in particular. Add to the list the recently assassinated Pim Fortune, whose pitting of gays against Muslims rocked the usually tolerant Netherlands. Fortune's version of right-wing politics differed from most of the rest of Europe, but his party tapped into a fear of strangers with its anti-immigration stance, winning 26 parliamentary seats, even after Fortune was gunned down, apparently by an animal rights extremist, angered because of Fortune's stance on furriers. 
Why bring up the dismal political scape of Europe in a review of Chocolat? The culture of this tranquil French town has an historic context that set up the fear and suspicion in ultimate acts of hatred that drove the storyline. The theme is an old one in Europe, and the Catholic Church has been central to this fear. She's laughing at us, laughing at our traditions. When are you going to do something about it? Long before the Nazis killed six million Jews and asserted the supremacy of the Aryan race, the so-called, quote, Jewish question, close quote, was debated in Europe. The current anti-immigrant debates have much the same flavor. During the Middle Ages, the official position of the Holy Roman Empire was that the Jews were to blame for the crucifixion. Jewish refusal to convert to Christianity was not only a sign of their sinfulness, but a sign of their antagonism to Christianity and their lack of political allegiance to Catholic rulers. With the advent of the Crusades in 1006, which is the first time Europe feared Muslims, the position of the Jews became extremely dangerous, forcing many Jewish communities into isolation and obscurity. In addition, myths of Jewish terrorism aimed at Christians abounded, creating fear and prejudice. This lack of an official position in society carried over into Protestant Europe as well. In the early 19th century, things changed. A belief in religious freedom and the separation of church and state an acceptance of Judaism as a religion and not just an ethnic identity, and a desire to access Jewish resources into the greater community and greater economy led to their emancipation throughout Europe. After emancipation, Jews did begin to assimilate into the greater culture, though very slowly and with great debate among themselves, and that assimilation created a backlash of prejudice and resentment towards Jews. This tension between the desire to assimilate and the desire to protect ethnic identity led to a Jewish intellectual class in Europe with two faces. The assimilated Jew, who played down his Jewishness in favor of his education, and the Jewish scholar, who reclaimed lost understandings of Jewish religious teachings. In addition to an intellectual class, a Jewish bourgeoisie emerged, including shopkeepers and artisans. Among this class were traveling merchants, traders. European communities in the 19th century were discovering each other. Most Europeans to that point had been tied to their land in some way. Industrialization led to the need to open up new markets. Jews were not allowed to own land for the most part in European history, and while they had ties to their communities, they seemed more willing to travel than many other Europeans. Thus, it was Jews who took jobs that sent them from town to town, to open up markets for products produced in major industrial centers. They were the classic middlemen who sold manufactured products to retail merchants for distribution to consumers. The study of strangers is a sociological phenomenon stemmed from concepts such as Karl Marx's alienation and Emile Durkheim's social enemy. But the first sociologist to directly discuss the archetypal stranger was Georg Zimmel, a Jew, who was never offered a position at university despite his obvious scholarship and his popularity as a salon speaker among the intellectuals in Berlin. Each of these concepts possesses economic roots. Marx's alienation originated in the separation of the worker from the product of his labor. Durkheim describes enemy in terms of dysfunctional methods of dividing labor. Zimmel's stranger moved from town to town working as a trader. While Zimmel did not invent the sociological archetype of the stranger, he expressed the meaning of the stranger profoundly. More important, he did not see the stranger as alienated and unsocial in the sense that Marx did. Instead, he asserted that the position of the stranger, someone who was both distant and near, brought an important element to relationships with others by virtue of his unique position. Both Vienne and Rue possess this distance and nearness in Chocolat. It is their strangeness that divides the town and creates tensions as the seasons of Lent progresses. Lack of respect for the fasting season by selling the wonderful confections and dancing on the river boats demonstrate to Comte how holy his quest is to rid his town of these pagans. But Vienne and Rue were part of what helped the town figure out its own character. The presence of a stranger drew the lines clearly, and it is no accident that it is the town's misfits 
that take to the strangers more easily than those who are vested in the town's culture. Most notably among these misfits is Josephine, whose husband's cruelty has led her to kleptomania and mannerisms bordering on schizophrenic. Her strangeness is accepted as part of the town culture because she stays in her proper place with her husband. Vienne's kindness to Josephine frees her to leave her husband and seek refuge from the town's culture and her husband's cruelty. This act is the beginning of change in the whole culture and atmosphere of the town. Black and white belief systems become gray as the Comte realizes that Josephine has suffered right under his nose. The illusion of his control and the town's tranquility begins to break down. At first, the Comte tries to regain control through reforming Josephine's husband and driving out the strangers Vienne and Rue, but these efforts eventually backfire. The position of the strangers offers an objectivity on the true nature of the town, and having seen itself through the eyes of others, the town changes, questioning its very foundations. This is a time of abstinence, reflection, above all, a time of sincere penitence. This, quote, objective, close quote, position of the stranger and its usefulness in the social system of a culture is one of the positive social aspects of the stranger archetype, according to Zimmel. Strangers are defined as strangers because they are different from us. And when we define who a stranger is, we define who we are in the process. The stranger is far from antisocial or non-social, it is a necessary concept in order to form a cohesive group. We have to know who we are not in order to know who we are. We can force them to understand that they are not welcome. The problem is that these attempts of definitions of us and them can lead to a marginalization of strangers. The river people were not only them, but they were regarded as a dangerous them and boycotted and excluded from commerce for being them. Would you like to come in for some chocolates? What about boycotting morality then? Robert E. Park coined the term marginalization in 1928 in his essay Human Migration in the Marginal Man. Concerned with the question of how races and cultures, quote, evolve, close quote, Park looked to migration and not biological evolution as the key to Quote, processes by which new relationships have been established between men. Close quote. Park moved the narrow view of the stranger into a broader context, which could include every person at some time in his or her life, because we all experience quote, periods of a transition and crisis in the lives of most of us that are comparable with those which the immigrant experiences when he leaves home to seek his fortunes in a strange country." Close quote. In the 1970s, Everett C. Hughes continued Parks's work by expanding the concept through analyzing marginality quote, from the angle of status. Close quote. In status, we find identity in our culture. In a very real way, culture and society meet in an individual's status. Quote, status is a term of society in that it refers specifically to a system of relationships between people, but the definition of status lies in a culture." Close quote. By looking at marginality through the lens of status, Hughes expands the concept beyond the traveler or migrant who intrudes on a social situation. In our society, the contact of cultures, races, and religions combines with social mobility to produce an extraordinary number of people who are marginal in some degree, who have some conflict of identity in their own minds, and who find some parts of the social world which they would like to enter closed to them, or open only at the expense of some treason to things and people they hold dear. This sets up a kind of inner conflict for strangers. How far must we go in changing our beliefs and identities in order to be accepted by others? Why do you give a damn about what these narrow-minded villagers think? Chocolat ends with both Vienne and Rue settling down in the town that they have changed. Not only does the town change by expanding its definition of us to include people who are from different backgrounds, but the strangers change as well. Rue leaves the river and his people to return to Vienne and Anouk. Vienne scatters her mother's ashes in the north wind as a symbol of her decision to no longer listen to her mother's voice or follow her mother's ways. 
something she believed was in her hereditary makeup at the beginning of the movie. Both characters forsake a part of themselves in order to belong to each other and to the town. These negotiations between strangers and friends take on great importance in the context of horrors like the Holocaust. The extent to which we succumb to the fear of the other, we set up despots who would lead us to such horrors. Since most of us have been the stranger as well as belong to a group, I am reminded of Martin Niemöller's famous quote about the Nazis, which he gave in response to a student's question, how could it happen? Quote, First they came for the communists, but I was not a communist, so I did not speak out. Then they came for the socialists and the trade unionists, but I was neither, so I did not speak out. Then they came for the Jews, but I was not a Jew, so I did not speak out. And when they came for me, there was no one left to speak out for me. Close quote. Chocolat offers a wonderful meditation on how strangers affect our lives and how the ways we define ourselves and others needs to be re-examined on a regular basis in order to not descend into xenophobic prejudices and hatred. It is a timely fable, and one that perhaps should be required viewing for us and our leaders in an increasingly fearful world. What better than chocolate to bring the world together? You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvic.ca. Giving sociology an edge! Seven-year-old Victoria resident Amra Allen has told her story in a book she self-published with the help of her son. It is a mundane story in many ways. As a young girl, she enjoys an active social life and the attention of young men. She falls in love with a man who turns out not to share her feelings. She settles for another suitor and marries him, knowing that she does not fully love him. They have two children a son, and then a daughter. What makes Amra's story different is that she is a Canadian living in Hitler's Germany, married to an SS soldier. In her naivete, she doesn't heed the warnings of war and must stay in Germany until 1945. Recently, at her home, she graciously read for me chapter 3 from her book, where she relates how she sealed her fate by ignoring the impending war.
The Girl Who Never Listened. In March 1938, Bill, my brother, and his wife, Margaret, came to Germany with a type of executive club. Bill was a geologist and worked for large oil companies finding places to drill oil wells. They looked me up and introduced me to several people. I was to return to Canada with them, but there was a chance for me to study further in München, Munich, so I was allowed to stay on. I should have listened to Bill, who urged me to go home. However, I insisted on staying, mainly because of my infatuation for Yoni. We had never lived together, but we were such good friends, and I really loved him and thought he loved me too. Soon after my brother left, I received an invitation to a musical evening at Professor Clemens Schmalstisch's home. My brother had introduced me to him. I was just about to throw the invitation out when my Aunt Paula yelled, Don't throw that away! Professor Schmalstisch is an important person. He conducts the Berlin Symphony Orchestra and teaches at the Berlin High School of Music, and his wife is a concert singer. You really must go. So I got all dressed up in a fuchsia-colored taffeta dress with one shoulder left bare. I had designed and made the dress at home and had, was happy to have an opportunity to wear it. When I arrived at the Schmalstisch home, I was greeted warmly and introduced all around. We sat in the beautiful music room and it was delightful, except that I was sitting on a satin-covered straight back chair. My taffeta dress made me constantly slip off and I had to try hard not to fall off. Also, that darn dress made loud, rustling noises. At least, I was very conscious of the sounds. I was so embarrassed and imagined all the guests heard the sounds, too. Suddenly, the door directly opposite me opened, and there stood a tall, handsome man in an SS uniform. As this is my first mention of SS, I will explain. The title of SS stands for Schutzstaffel, their common name. There was also the Waffen SS, guards of ghettos and concentration camps. Nazi stormtroopers were called SA or brown shirts, which was their common name. Police were also Nazis. They were all Nazis! Handsome man in a striking SS uniform was Siegmund Schmalstisch, the professor's son. After the music, there were refreshments, including champagne. I really liked Professor Schmalstisch, best of all the people present. He sat me beside him and treated me very cordially. It was great. I felt that it was an honor to be chosen. There was lots of champagne. Professor Schmalstisch told me that the famous composer, Paderewski, had been his teacher, and that Paderewski had a bathtub with colored light so that he could see himself in several colors. Imagine that, isn't that absolutely nuts? He surely must have liked himself. I wonder if he had a favorite color. Professor and Mrs. Smalstisch had three children, Inga, Clemens, and Siegmund. They were all born five years apart. Inga had been married before I met the family. Clemens had also been married prior to our meeting and had a terrible case of infantile paralysis. Siegmund played the accordion and loved to draw pictures, illustrations for books, etc. Professor Schmalstisch was a composing an opera, which was later performed in Hamburg. I never did hear it. I later learned that Herr Professor Schmalstisch had a Jewish mistress, whom he helped escape from Germany. Frau Professor Lies Lissy Schmalstisch was a concert singer. I was very fortunate to hear lots of operas and concerts, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Frau Professor Schmalstisch also had cats, Siamese, Persians, etc. They were each confined to their own room, and even one in the bathroom. That one walked around the tub when someone was using the facilities in her domain. I thought it very comical. Siegmund took a shine to me, and we went out quite often. He had a car, which made it easy to get around. I mentioned the car because not many people owned one. My Uncle Paul owned one, Yoni also had one, and Siegmund had one. There were also strange-looking cars with only three wheels. Siegmund and I would go for long rides all over Berlin. However, he was an SS man and was away a lot, with few leaves from the army, so I did not get to know him very well. At the time, I didn't know the SS was associated with the worst of Hitler's regime, 
and to me it just meant that Siegmund was in the army. He was a private whose duties included being a sort of messenger. He rode a motorcycle while on duty. Although his schedule did not allow much free time, Siegmund and I would go to dances and parties when he was home. One evening, we were invited to a party at a diplomat's home in the country. That gentleman had visited my family and me in Ottawa. Because gas for the car was unavailable due to rationing, we took a streetcar to the party. I had a wonderful time and was a real flirt, making Siegmund jealous. I loved to do that. Jealousy was called sitting on the green sofa. He always was. The schedule for the streetcar changed to shorter routes in the evenings. I did not know that, but Siegmund did. He finally suggested we should leave. I didn't want to go, but he said again, we must go. Still, we remained. I was all dressed up and was wearing spike heels. When we finally left, we had a long, long way to walk. I took off my shoes and walked in stocking feet. Boy, was I mad. Siegmund simply said, I warned you. Serve me right, I guess. I just never listened and should have. I must say that at the party we drank wine and someone told a joke. I was laughing so hard that when I put the crystal glass down on the table, the stem broke. I was very embarrassed. Later on, I was telling someone about this, and my goodness, I put the wine glass I was using on the table, and that stem broke too. Now I'm very careful. Wine glasses must be properly handled. Siegmund had leave off and on, and when he was in Berlin, we went out a lot. He was an excellent dancer. It was there that I really learned the Viennese waltz dancing with him. Gradually, Siegmund became very fond of me and eventually asked me to marry him. I was not ready for marriage in any way. I wanted to go home to Canada one day, even feeling the way I felt for Yoni. I haven't said much about Yoni and what and where we went, because he had little free time away from the theater and I had a very busy, active social life. Amra, you can't walk with Ursula anymore, my Aunt Paula said to me one day, quite without warning. Why? Why can't I walk with her? I said, astounded. That's when Paula told me that Ursula was part Jewish. I felt really awful, especially as our family had been raised not to discriminate against race, creed, or color, one person was as good as another, so I had to tell Ursula. It was extremely difficult to do, but she understood at once, and I never saw her again. How can I explain my feelings when I had to tell Ursula I couldn't walk with her? It was absolutely against my upbringing. I was so embarrassed. Later I found out how dangerous and potentially deadly it was to be Jewish or part Jewish. Even associating with a Jew could spell disaster. It was scary. This was the second sign of how the Holocaust affected me personally, and I was upset and fearful. Holocaust? I did not learn about that word until after I got out of Germany. I had to discriminate against Ursula because she was part Jewish, and that was not the way I had been brought up. Being a civilian, it was hard to realize or understand that according to Hitler, Jews were an inferior race and could not be tolerated in Germany. One had to be a perfect Aryan. Even if people did not know what Hitler's plans were, they knew that when a Jew or part Jew was taken away, he never came back. Marriage between Jew and Gentile was forbidden even before the war. The generals and SS knew what was taking place. So did the aristocrats, but not the general public. That is the truth. I am sure you will find this hard to believe. I think I finished my school courses in Berlin soon after the incident with Ursula and was scheduled to begin studying at a school in Munich. It was a very expensive school and I had to get certification from home to prove that I had dual citizenship and thus was entitled to reduced fees. I also had trouble finding cheaper rooms because my accent gave me away, but I solved that by going in with another student. When people heard my English accent, they would charge me more for rent. I guess they thought I was a rich American. Soon after arriving in Munich and starting my classes, my mouth became very sore and I went to a dentist. 
I was told that all my fillings had to be taken out and gold fillings put in. Well, you can imagine how the price of that scared me. You see, there again, the price was exorbitant and probably on account of my accent. I called my parents and quoted the three quarters of the price. Mother called me back and said that father was on his way to Berlin. Oh, gee, was I ever delighted to learn this and flew back to Berlin to meet him. I felt like a lost soul finding home again. What a glorious feeling to see my father. What a surprise it was. I hugged and kissed my wonderful father. I was so overjoyed to see him. He took me to another dentist and we learned the cause of my discomfort was only a gum infection. Thank goodness the first dentist didn't get away with what he wanted to do. In reality, Father had come to take me home. Paula got on her knees and begged him to leave me there with her. She said that at first a young girl was forced on her and she did not want one. After all this time, however, she had gotten used to having me around and to take me away was not fair. So again, I was allowed to stay. I should have listened to my father. Today, I cannot understand why father acquiesced to Paula, because he knew better than I did what lay in store. In fact, before I even left home in Ottawa, he took one of those small match boxes, lit a match, held it under the match box, and said, this is Germany. So it was not entirely my fault that I remained there. I did not know what lay in store. Why did my parents send me to Germany? They must have known that war was inevitable, or did they? What did the rest of the world know? Upon my return to Canada, I did not ask them. I guess I felt it would not be right to ask, after all the worry and suffering they went through and all they had done for me. Father was traveling on a diplomatic passport and could not stay long in Germany. He was on official business. He had to leave all too soon, and shortly after his departure, there was a hint of war in the Dancy Corridor. But what young girl reads newspapers? Besides, I was in Berlin, and the Dancy Corridor was so far away. I just felt the war was in Danzig and would remain there with no thought the possibility of a world war. How many times have there been other wars that could have started world wars? People think it won't happen here, and that's what I thought. However, I was definitely wrong, and suddenly it did happen. Soon after, Dad wrote letters telling me to come home. I didn't. There was not listening again, and he wrote again and again, go to Holland, go to Switzerland, go, go, go not me. Get out of there. I was in love. I did not realize what it meant. How was I to know war would last for years? I remembered writing Dad and telling him about Joni. My family was well acquainted with the German ambassador to Canada. And when he was recalled to Germany, he came and knocked on Paula's door and said, get out of Germany. But I refused. Ditto. Not listening. Absolutely bemused. Ambassador's wife wanted to go to Italy and wanted me to go with her and then on to Canada. Even then, after the embassy was recalled, how could she think that one could go to Italy? As it turned out, we couldn't get out of Germany anyway. It was too late. I was so in love we couldn't bear to leave Yoni. I had written Dad so he would understand and I certainly did not know there would be a world war. It was still only in the dancing corridor as far as I was concerned. Now I know that when an ambassador is recalled, it really means war or something very serious. I was down to my last chance. The Canadian Embassy wrote and said this was my final opportunity to leave. But I could not escape my love for Noni. Hitler declared war in 1939. The door slammed shut and there was no way out.
You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM, Victoria. I first met Amra Allen at her garage sale. It was a bright, sunny Saturday morning, and she was sitting on her walker. She and her neighbors were having a fairly typical Victoria garage sale, except that Amra was also selling her book, Torn, A True Story. The next time I met Amra Allen, we sat in her home and talked about how life went from a young girl's dreams of parties and suitors to a young mother's nightmare of escaping the bombing of Berlin with her two children on a displaced persons train. And we talked about how life has been since those dark days of war. What made you decide to write it down? Well, somewhere in here, I had, when I got home, I guess they all asked me to write about it. You see, and then I didn't do the first chapter, I just did this little bit here, but then they said I better let people know who, who I am, yeah. you know. So I did that first chapter, and, but you see, I don't type. Oh, you hand, hand. That's right, you hand wrote all of this, mm -hmm. didn't you? I wrote things here on another piece of paper and I but just quit. It was just too damn much. Was it hard to write about it because it was emotional? Yes. Because it was a hard memory to go back to? Yes. And there are still things that I do not remember how I ever did it, especially on the DP train when I got off it finally, because it was so horrible. I just got off that train. Now, I had no money. I had no way of getting money. Nobody knew where I was. You had your two kids with you. And I had two kids, and I got off the train, and I had to get the kids clean. So I had to find a place that would accept me. Did you tell your kids the story? I mean, do, I guess your son might have been old enough to remember some of this. I never had very much time to talk over this with him. Mm -hmm. My father took him to someone that checks up the ability of a child. Mm -hmm. At one time he was in grade three and he should have been in grade five. And, that was and he never he was finished before. grade school, but he became an electronics engineer. He went to the dockyard and said, I want to be an electronics engineer. Well, yeah, I mean, fin finish grade 12. What are you talking about? I'm go going to be an electronics engineer. And he said, well, there's three years of study. He said, well, give me the third book. And he read it and he got 98%. Wow. And he became what he wanted and he's in the States and he has his own business. And now he published this book for you. Yes. Does he publish other books or no. is this something that he just the, put together just, just, just for, to do your story? And what is it? This is the second printing. It's really the third one. You were selling them at yes. a yard sale. Yeah. Do you do that Never often? Done that that was the first time. Not yes. before, but I used to go to the Salvation Army and bowl. And I had all these friends. And so I said, hey, do you want to read this book, you know? And I sold seven of them right away just sitting there. Since your your son and you didn't talk about the story when he, he was, was young. He was away, you see. At what point did you finally tell him this story? And he said, let's put it together in a book. A I notebook? had somebody type it out. So somebody, you gave this to someone and they you typed see? it up. That was the first time that he heard the yeah. story. There's the disc. And when you sent him the disc, was he planning on putting it together in a I book at that point? I asked him to do it. Who am I going to get to sit beside me and listen to this and type it out? I mean, I just couldn't. When did you tell your daughter this story? Did she just read the book and find out the story that way? Yeah, or? you see, when they were little here in Canada, they were going to school, they were learning to speak English, they were, you know... Amra had a number of letters and book reviews people have sent her about the book. She shared several of them with me, including one written by a friend 
who was in Germany at the same time she was. I enjoyed your amazing book. Marty is reading it too. You must have taken notes along the way to help you remember those names. I didn't. People, towns, homes, etc. You did a great job. And these are just things that I've kept because I think it's important. When I got bombed out, I lost everything. I, mu I didn't take my address book with me. <laughs> I didn't take any pictures. I didn't take a camera. I took what I had to take mm -hmm. so that I had no addresses. And I imagine after the war it was hard finding, especially the Germans yes. that you knew. And at one time a friend of ours was going to that area of Germany where my uncle lived. And I said, will you please try and look up this name, Baron von Leerlis? And he did, and he had died. But every, all the other people, I can't get a hold of them. See, the only way I could contact my father, like when the when parents, when the, when the war started, and you couldn't write only in your own zone, like there were four zones. Mm -hmm. Well, I managed to have somebody in Norway that I wrote to, and they sent it on. So you, you were able to communicate some with your parents during the war? Just for a short while. Okay. And that was gone, too. And everything stopped. When you got back to Canada, finally, which was right after the war, you were one of the first to mm -hmm. get out of Germany. Yeah, but it took ten months in England. Yeah. And where did you come? Did you come to Ottawa? The book indicates, I think, that you eventually made it out to Victoria. Is well, that first I was in Montreal, where the boat landed, and right. I had a brother there. And my sister came to Montreal to meet me, and my two brothers and my sister. My other sister was in the hospital having a baby in Ottawa. Otherwise, she probably would have come too. So we stayed for three days in Montreal, three days in Ottawa, and that was September the 22nd that my grand uh, niece was born there, you see, on that date. And then it, we went to Victoria on a, a coach with, with a suite, you know, mm -hmm. so I have a bathroom and, a, you know, a toilet and a wash basin. And, uh, and this is with your kids? Yeah, you? yeah, yeah. That was very nice. And then we went all across Canada that way. They met me at the boat. In Victoria. And why did you decide to come to Victoria? Because my father had retired. Out. He had retired. Mm -hmm. He was the first botanist Canada ever had. Wow. He built all the research stations all across Canada. And that's why he knew the Russian ambassador, he knew the German ambassador, he knew the Canadian commissioner. He knew everybody. He was an important, well-known man. And because he had that kind of influence, that's what helped you get out of Germany. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. God knows what would have happened. Without your father's influence, it could, you could have just as easily been defined as a German. Oh, definitely. See, I didn't have a passport anymore. Mm -hmm. I didn't take my passport. It was bombed out. Yeah. I mean, do you have your passport with you? No. Not right this minute, no. <laughs> you go home and it's not there anymore. Yeah. So I had nothing. You never remarried? I did remarry you here did. in Canada. And then I had um, one daughter. Oh, so you have you have another child besides yeah, the two missions. She is in, lives in Vancouver. Okay. So my son is 62 now. Did you go back? Did you do any uh, designing or anything Definitely. like that? I, yes. de I designed for the Admiral's wife in the dockyard. And you see, I had learned pattern drafting. So I take your measurements, okay? I can make, uh, and I take my book and I draw out exactly what you want. I even chose the material, and I just could have made that dress and it fit you right mm -hmm. away, but I always went in for a fitting. So I get down to the dockyard, you know, and stop the car at the gate. Where's your pass? She said, I don't have one. I said, well, just phone Mrs. Lanny Moore and tell her that I can't come in and do the fitting. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That happened. And then after she left, she said the only thing she would want to take with her was me. But she said she gave my name, name to the next admiral's wife. So I did that. And I did that for doctor's wives. I mean, if you would phone me up, I put an ad in the paper. I have not gun will travel, but I have a portable machine mm -hmm. will travel. And that's how I started. 
Yes, I, if you only wanted to have a, a, a hymn done, dress shortened, you'd never see me again. I wanted to design. Right. You see, and that's what I did. And I became quite famous. You were in Victoria all of that time, or did you? Work? Yes, yes. You lived in Victoria, Victoria since. I lived on the Old West Road, and I had a very big table for my pattern doings and stuff. I had everything mm -hmm. out of my home. Tell me why you called the book torn. Well, because I was torn between staying there and coming home. I was just torn. Like, I wrote in the book that sometimes I felt like jumping off the sidewalk and getting run over, mm -hmm. you know? Because it was so horrible. It was so horrible. And, and I was torn between the love of Yoni, and, and he never married me. I cannot understand him. Because when I applied for that job at the... At the munitions. Well, what turned out to be a munitions yes, factory. Yes, when I applied for that and didn't go, the SS called me in. And, oh, I just like just so scared, you know. And I was just this high off the table, you know. I was so frightened. I hadn't done anything wrong. What's the matter? What's the matter? And he said, you applied for this job. And I, I couldn't remember. Because he said I was doing fashion design and everything else. But, oh, yes, I do remember. And he said, well, you're a traitor. And now I'm in Houston's factory. Well, how would you like that to happen? Mm. I said, I'm getting married in two weeks. Because, see, he wanted to marry me. He mm. really did love me. And I'd learned to love him. But when I went to Yoni and I said, I'm going to be interned. I have said, to get married. He said he wouldn't. But you did stay in touch with him. He phoned me up until, I guess, when he died. About 79, I think. Yeah. But he never said he loved me or anything. He just liked, well, to keep in touch, you know. And we did. Yeah. I sent him cards or something like that, you know, but I never phoned him. Were there things that you really loved about Germany? Was it only him that kept well, you torn? Or? I had traveled very much in Germany and all the people like I was visiting relatives mainly that was why I went over mm -hmm. and they were all wonderful to me. And one last question you know there's a lot of fear right now after what happened in September in the States and there's a lot of talk of war now. Are there similar feelings? Well when you were in Germany and you wanted to get out the same way you're in Canada you want to get out or vice versa. You couldn't. You couldn't. It's getting to be that way here, mm -hmm. isn't it? But on the other hand, somebody says you don't need a passport. You need just your driver's license to get to the States. But I don't know how true that is. I don't go traveling anymore. That is very much like it was. And the threat, you see, it's in the United States. It's not going to happen in little old Victoria. Mm -hmm. It's the same feeling, isn't it, that yeah. you have? It's not going to happen here. There's nothing worth blowing up, maybe, you know, compared to the bigger cities in Canada. Even Vancouver might, might get it, but we would feel safer, right? you know? That's the way I felt, that it was not going to be anything like it. Now, it could happen that it's a war, but people always, when I talk about it, they always poo-poo it, you know, because it's not going to happen. But what about now? Look at it. That war was starting in one place. Mm -hmm. And look at how it is spread already. If it comes to that, and you have to go through what we went through in Berlin, the first thing is that you had to be off the street. Mm -hmm. You had to go into it any place in your home, somebody's home you had, they couldn't keep you out. They had to take you in. And another thing was the, the treatment of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. They would come into your home, get out. And you were allowed to take a bag with you. What for? You never going to be able to use it. And people knew that. Like that one time when I was going to school and I saw the stores all broken and Jew written all over them. Mm -hmm. Now what a feeling to get that but it was frightening so. but you know when I think back when I was on board ship and everybody was getting off but me 
where are you going? I said, I'm going to Germany. We don't want to go there now. I said, well, I'm going there. So they knew already. Yeah. But it was touch and go. Why did my parents send me there? I mean, why did they? I never asked them. Of course, I was only to stay four months. They warned me to come up. My father came to take me home. My brother came to take me home. Yeah. Gee, why didn't they just turn me over and scrap <laughs> me? I mean, I could have gone home. I could have gone home. And if we wanted to get married, if you only wanted to marry me, I could have come back, you know, or something. What wasn't that it was hard up. Did anything else as exciting or as dangerous happen to you since the war? No, just, I've always had a lot of fun. Fun. As I told you, I was a flirt. And you know, even today, they say I don't look my age and I don't act it. And I could have guys, in fact, this whole household said, well, if there's a guy working here, he'll talk to Amra. The name of the book is Torn, A True Story. If you'd like to get a copy of Amra Allen's book, you can contact her directly in Victoria at area code 250-382-8168 or call us here at CFUV 721-8700 and we'll give you that information again. have been listening to First Person Plural, because how people get along with each other still matters. First Person Plural is a show created for community radio by Carl Wilkerson and Dr. Patty Thomas to examine social and organizational issues. Music for First Person Plural is performed, composed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson, except where noted. For more information about First Person Plural, Dr. Patty Thomas, or Carl Wilkerson, Visit our website, www.culturalconstructioncompany.com, or email us at fpp at culturalconstructioncompany.com.